cross-examination. May it please the court? I didn't know you had passed. I don't think I did. I'll pass oh, it. Oh, I do apologize. Oh, I'm sorry. You're... We'll pass the witness. Pass the witness. Very Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Sergeant Quinn. Good afternoon. And let me say congratulations on your retirement. It's a great, <laughs> great feat. Um, I'm just going to have some simple questions on cross-examination for you. Um, It's been revealed that major offenders in undercover operations are a proactive squad. Is that a fair assessment? That's correct. And so as being part of a proactive squad, you kind of, you try and assess the full scenario. Is that correct? That is correct. You go through and you want to try and determine the actual risk. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the last part. You wanted to determine the actual risk. Correct. And you want to try and investigate to see if there is any real danger. Is that correct? Yes, sir. So on you guys were contacted, your office was contacted by Michael Kubach, is that correct? Uh, district Attorney's Office was. The DA's office, and they got yes, in sir. touch with you? Yes, sir. Would you mind pulling the mic just a little bit closer so it's a sure. clear? After Michael Kubach called you, it was your opinion that they needed to get in touch with this confidential informant, Motaz Azay, or Zach, is that correct? Yes, uh, Kubosh called the district attorney's office, yes, and it was decided to get in contact with Zach, right? And so on February the 23rd, you testified today that you went ahead and okayed the order to get in touch with Megan. Well, yes, I got in touch with Megan. And that was after just one conversation with Kubosh, you decided the proper steps was to go ahead and plan Megan to depart the state of Texas? Well, we're trying to determine the veracity. Is there actually a murder for hire? So we interview everybody involved, and we interviewed Megan. Right. And, yes. Right. So on the 23rd, I think it's two days after you contacted, you were informed about Kubosh, mm -hmm. you went ahead and contacted Megan. Is that correct? Right. When you look at everything on a whole, uh, Michael Kubosh... Right. And so you wanted to get in touch with Zach Motaz, is that correct? The district attorney's office got in touch with Zach, yes. But it, it, took, it took two weeks to get in touch with Zach, is that correct? No, it took them, uh, it looks a little longer than it is because February is a shorter month if you look at it, but it didn't take them that long. It took about a week and a half then. Right, somewhere it there. took more than 10 days. Well, you'd look at the dates, but it, it took as long as it took to find him. They had to locate right, so him. It took longer... You're I do apologize, Your Honor. Right. So it did take more than a week then. You had trouble. You had trouble locating him at first. Yes. And Zach never voluntarily came forward to you guys. Uh, or it, anybody. Uh, no. And at the time of first meeting with Zach, you had no knowledge whether or not he was taking any money or anything about him, did you? Uh, the district attorney's office interviewed him first, yes. And they made a report that they then sent to you? Yes. So your office never really contacted Zach until it was time to set up this investigation? No, we had a pre-interview with him after the district attorney's office contacted him. We, were, we met with them and him also to determine the validity of his statement. Was there a report made? For that statement? Uh, the district attorney's office made a report of the statement interview that they did, yes. But you said that you did a report, or you had, an, you had we, a statement made with him. No, no. We, we met with him. We interviewed him. But there was no report made about that interview? No. Now, <clears throat> you also said something interesting earlier today and that you refer to the, the suspects, if you will, as targets. You don't refer to them as suspects, but you find them as targets. Is that correct? No, a suspect. You do suspect? We use suspect, yes. On direct examination, you constantly kept referring to them as targets. I don't believe so. So you said it's your goal to verify the veracity before starting the investigation. You want to make sure that these things are true before you start the actual investigation. That's fair? That's, that's fair. 
and yet you contacted Megan before verifying with Zach or any person else involved with these statements. You heard from Kubosh and went straight to Megan. Yes, when a bondsman with that level of experience and he's a Senate councilman tells you that... Objection not responsive. Yes or no? Just try to answer directly. Yes. So you quickly contacted Megan, didn't verify the veracity, and told her that someone may be trying to kill her. Well, I beg to differ. That, we, I say we did verify the veracity to, to our satisfaction, yes. With one witness, Michael Kubosh, whose statement does not reveal that. Yes, he said he believed that he, uh, he was out to harm Megan to kill Megan. That's my understanding, yes. Did you review the statement that was made from him to the ADA's office? No, sir. You did not? No, just what's well, in the report. Well, that's I'm talking about in general, before okay. this investigation started. And your officers that work with major offenders made a report in this case, did they not? Yes, sir. And would you be surprised to realize that Michael Kubosh, when asked the question, of whether or not he felt Leon wanted to kill her or get her out of Pittsburgh, he could not answer that question. Well, he... I think it's a misstatement of the evidence that the jury heard. Violation of the rule. Would you be surprised to find out that in his statement reported to your office, when asked whether or not Michael Kubosh felt Leon Jacob wanted her taken care of to mean getting out of town to Pittsburgh or killed, he could not verify that he thought she wanted him killed. That would surprise me, yes. So without being able to verify the veracity, you wanted to go ahead and alert Megan that somebody may want her out to be killed, to put that kind of panic and fear in her. Certainly, if we... Compound question. Sustained. To our satisfaction. Oh, sorry. Yes, sir. Break that question up. Yes, Your Honor. So, without verifying the veracity of these allegations, you wanted to go ahead and alert Megan that someone may be trying to kill her. I felt there was cert certainly justification to do that, yes. You wanted to go ahead and put that fear and shock into her. I wanted to alert her. Sorry. If he stands up, I'll yes, sir. And it was at that point you guys decided it was time to go ahead and further evaluate this and get the undercover officer Duran involved. Is that correct? Correct. So from that point on, you guys were going to go ahead and try and set up an attempted murder. I don't know what you're saying. You went into the Olive Garden with the guise of going in forward to get this target, this suspect, to try and admit to wanting somebody dead. Is that correct? No, sir. We went in to meet with him to see what his intentions were. And upon hearing various times that he wanted her to go to Pittsburgh, you guys did not take that as what he wanted? No, that's obviously what... That's not, that's not what he wanted. Would you be surprised to realize that throughout the course of the Olive Garden tape, well, you've reviewed the Olive Garden tape, have you not? Correct. So when, when Officer Duran is saying, I understand you want no one hurt, that means nothing? Or is that him trying to force it? Well... When he says his life's a lot more important than hers, he's just an uneducated middle-class person from Pittsburgh. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to and stop you. What, uh, can I come take a look at what you're reading real quick? Sure. May I approach you on it? Uh, I don't think it's necessary. Just ask the question again. When Officer Duran said, I understand that you prefer no one get hurt, it's your opinion that that means nothing. When he offered to come give her an injection to start to stop her heart? That's, that's not answering the question. Sorry. He wants to know if that statement is not 
have any meaning to you or is believable, I guess. Is that really what you're asking? Yes, Your Honor. Well, no, we look at the whole entirety of the conversation. You also testified today that after you reached out to Megan, Leon was still communicating with her. Is that correct? Attempting to, I think. Attempting to. Were those communications in any way threatening? Are you aware if they are threatening? No, I was not aware if they were threatening. You were aware that Leon and Megan did have a relationship prior to the breakup for this point? Correct, sure. That they were in love? Yes. And that there was a lot of emotions involved? Well, certainly. <clears throat> now, I want I wanted to go to the night, I think it was the 9th, I believe, of the death notice. Mm -hmm. Correct. How many officers were on scene that night? Well, let's see, there were two uniformed officers, myself, uh, Sergeant Snyder. Uh, I saw uh, Officer Cisneros in there, Cisneros, and uh, Liz Mahalko was in there. So I, as far as I recall, maybe that was the only people on the video, officers maybe. So there was about five or six officers, I believe? Around there, yes. Is that common for a death notice? Well, I think in this case it was certainly warranted, yes. So it's not common for a death notice then to have six officers there? No, but it was necessary on this one. Right, but it's not common. Understand? Probably not. Um, and you went forward to try and say, sorry, scratch that. In your experience as a police officer, is it common for people to become anxious around officers? When you're there to inform them that something happened to a loved one, would they be anxious? Well, in, in general, if you, you pull somebody over for a traffic ticket or you stop them on the sidewalk, are they not anxious or nervous? I think it depends how you handle the situation. You can make people feel at ease, and I think in that situation, they were obviously at ease. And then you further went into that to give that death notice. You informed them Mac had been killed. You informed them how. And then you asked if they had any info. Is that correct? Correct. And then you were shocked, and I think you referred to it as an alibi, when Leon said, no, we've been here all night. Could that not be interpreted as him offering, no, we have no information. This is why we have no information? Well... It's on the tape, and people can see it and interpret it the way they want to. I'm just telling you how I interpret it from my experience. Right. And you can understand how that could be interpreted differently. I don't, but I, I can. No, I don't. But that's up to the individual. On that same night of the 9th, did you ever have a conversation with Valerie? Yes, sir. And did you record that conversation? Yes, we did. And throughout that conversation, did you ask her questions? Did you ask her the question, um, what she wanted to have happen to Mac? I would have to see the transcript. Or, did, I don't have it a sounds like, I yes. So, um, oh, is this the one you marked? What? And which portion you're referring to? I have no idea. Oh, okay. Anyway, what, what were you asking? During your talk with Valerie on that night, did you ask her the question what she wanted to have happen to Mac McDaniel? Yes, we interviewed her at length. Uh huh. And did she go forward to tell you that I guess I wanted Mac McDaniel dead? Yes. And you asked her, was that the agreement made that you wanted Mac McDaniel dead? Probably. Okay, let me stop you. Are you not using? You don't need to stand. Well, if I could look at the transcripts, that'd be great. Well, I thought he was still referring to them, Your Honor. No, I haven't. I need a chance to read them. 
Well, if there's a discrepancy, you can. Otherwise, it would be interesting. Yes, Your Honor. So Valerie did admit that she wanted her ex-husband dead. Yes, she did. And did you follow it up and ask what Leon wanted to have happened? I don't recall. Would you mind taking a look at the transcripts to see? During Valerie's statement to you, did you ask her what Leon's plan was for Megan? And what? We just, let's rephrase. Yes, Your Honor. When you were talking to Valerie, did she tell you Leon's plan was to get Megan to go back to Pittsburgh? Yeah, she could have mentioned that, sure. Do you want to look at the transcript to see? It's a long transcript. You happen to know where you're referring to? I don't know if they have both statements in there, but it's going to be the second statement. If you can point it out, please come up and do so. This is statement number one. We asked her uh, who did she give the watches to. She said she gave the watches to Leon. What did he tell you? That's not the question. That's not the question. The question was, during the statement, <clears throat> did Megan tell you that Leon was trying, sorry, did Valerie tell you that Leon was trying to get Megan to go back to Pittsburgh? Uh, it mentions that at one time, maybe. Maybe. It, it does or it doesn't. Uh, I want to be careful not make a mistake. Mm -hmm. Do you have what you looking at? Yes, sir. We, we found the page that the reference is made on, but he's just going back to it. Well, that's one of the reference there. Yeah, that's it. Yes, she said no. The idea originally was to get her back to Pittsburgh. The idea was to go back to Pittsburgh. And you mentioned a while ago about the watches as well. Does mm -hmm. Valerie reveal that those watches were in fact hers? Yes, and she gave them to Leon. And Valerie was arrested that night as well, was she not? She was. Pass the witness, Your Honor. Thank you for the judge. Thank you for the Behind the monitors, the rest of the Next witness, please. Your Honor, at this time, the state of Texas rests. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have an adequate pick up outside of your presence. You can go with the bailiff. We'll have you back out in just a couple of minutes. Uh, I'm not guilty in that. Uh, at this time, the state has failed to prove uh, beyond a reasonable doubt uh, the nature of the case, uh, the allegations against the defendant, and would ask that the court uh, um, so instruct the jury to uh, return a verdict of not guilty. Very well. Thank you so much. And that will be denied. Uh, how many witnesses do you anticipate again? Uh, we have four witnesses, Your Honor. Uh, one, one of whom is the uh, mother of, and I think we've let the state know, uh, the mother of uh, the defendant. Uh, she's downstairs on the 15th floor, present being served with an instanter subpoena. Uh, we have... Um, and who's going to be your first witness? Our, our first witness would be, it would be uh, the mother if we could get her up here. Um, well, is there any problem with getting her? I see no problem at all. Well, let's get her up here then. All right. Uh, if I may just have a moment, Judge, to make sure that subpoena has been served. Very well. Thanks, Judge. And, Judge, to remind the court, we asked for a hearing outside the presence of the jury regarding the expert who he intends to call maybe after the mother. Yes. Uh, before he calls, yes, before we, you call, I understand, an expert witness. Yes, have we, a, we have agreed to not a problem. problem. Don't be a Dalbert, uh, a Dalbert proceeding. Okay, so before you call him, let us know you're ready to call him, and we'll have that here. I, I, I will. All right, thank you. I'm going to have a moment. Where's Roger? Do you swear or affirm that you trust 
on it. Just want to be the truth, the whole truth, <coughs> and nothing but the truth. Stuff you done. I do. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. Uh, state your name for the ladies and gentlemen of this jury. My name gentlemen. is Golda R. Jacob. And Ms. Jacob, uh, you're the mother of uh, Leon Jacob, are you not? I am. Uh, Ms. Jacob, uh, how are you employed? I'm an attorney. I'm employed. I have a small a boutique firm. We do family law. All right. And how long have you been practicing family law? We've had 25 years. All right. Um, is there a certification in family law that uh, you engage in? Excuse me? Is there any type of certification? Oh, yes. Uh, I'm board certified in family law. All right. By the state of Texas. All right. And, and what does that entail, uh, Ms. Jacob? How do you get certified? Well, you have to practice a certain number of years, uh, so I believe five years with a substantial amount of your time relegated to family practice. Uh, my practice is about 98% family practice and has been for probably the last 25 years. Uh, and, and then you have, to, uh, you have to also meet certain requirements with regard to jury trials, uh, um, mediations, temporary orders, hearings, uh, trials on custody, as well as trials on property. Uh, appeals can also, you can use appeals instead of jury trials to uh, meet those criteria if you've done some of those. And then you take a test. All right. And you're presently in trial downstairs on the 15th floor, are you not? Correct. Uh, Ms. Jacob, uh, When did we first meet? We first met. You didn't know me prior to this case, correct? No, sir. All right. Uh, even though we office in the same building, we had not met each other. That's correct. Um, I want to ask you some questions about uh, a individual that I believe you represented. Uh, are you familiar with Valerie McDaniel? Yes. And in what capacity are you familiar with Valerie McDaniel? Valerie McDaniel was my next door neighbor, and I also represented her in her divorce action um, about a year and a half ago. All right. And um, in relationship to Valerie McDaniel, um, I take it the divorce action was between Valerie being represented by you and, and whom? And her husband, uh, Mac McDaniel, uh, who uh, was represented by uh, Looper Reed. Um, it was Kyle Sanders. All right. Uh, dur during the course of your representation of Valerie McDaniel, uh, did she uh, say anything to you about uh, uh, any intention as far as uh, Mac McDaniel is concerned? Did uh, you have any impression uh, during the course of your representation of Valerie McDaniel, you personally yourself, as to uh, her relationship with Mac? Uh, she hated him. Sorry? She hated him. Uh, and... Uh, was that exemplified in any way other than the divorce proceeding? She wished he was dead. Okay. Uh, did she ever talk about any type of contract or anything of that fashion on his life? Yes. I pass this witness. Thank you. So you're telling me that during representation of Valerie McDaniel, she spoke to you about taking a contract out on her husband's life. Yes, sir. And don't you have an obligation as a lawyer to report that? I didn't take it seriously. 
You didn't take it seriously? No, sir. Okay, so you knew why you were coming to court today to testify about that statement, correct? Yes. But well, no, not really. But you're telling this jury now that you did not take that statement seriously? I did not. You never reported that, correct? I never reported it. Now, you were familiar with Megan, right? You know who Megan was? Yes. And when Megan left your son, he was pretty upset, wasn't he? Very. Um, how would you how would you how would you describe the, the manner in which he was acting immediately after the breakup? He was really upset. He was sorry about their argument, uh, very remorseful, and um, wanted to try to talk her into coming back. He was angry too, wasn't he? No, I don't remember him being angry. Um, you would you would call his attempts to communicate with Megan immediately after the breakup harassing, wouldn't you? I can't really answer that. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I wasn't there. Judge, may I approach? Excuse me. I'm going to go ahead and offer the state's exhibit right now. 60, 61, 62, 63, and 64. These are all part of the records. They've been testified to previously, and the predicate's been laid. I'll change that to 61 through 65, Judge. We have no objection at this time. Thank you so much. 61 through 65 states exhibits. show you, ma'am, what's been admitted in States Exhibit 65. And before we get into this, can you tell me who Vladimir is? Vladimir is a uh, caterer. And uh, he is a, an acquaintance of both Megan and your son, correct? Well, he was actually an acquaintance of mine. Your son knew who he was, correct? Yes. And he had his telephone number? Okay. I wouldn't well, know that. Okay, and, and do you remember the date that uh, Megan left your son? I think, it, it, uh, can you be specific? Are you talking about the date they had an argument? The, the date that she left, the incident for which he was later charged with assault, that day. I'm sorry? The date of the incident that he was, charge, he was charged with assault for later on. It was January of 2017, I think. January 12th, does that sound right? I don't remember the exact date. Would, would that be... Is that possible it could have been that day, January 12th? Possible. Okay. I'm going to point out here at the bottom of State's Exhibit 65 a message. And this is your number, correct, right here? Let me zoom in for you. That's my number. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to read from a text you wrote to your son. Texting and calling is harassment. Now of Vladimir as well. Okay. When you say as well, the implication there is that you're now telling him he's harassing Vladimir as well as Megan, correct? Yes. So when I asked you earlier whether you could describe his behavior as harassing, certainly back in January of 17, you thought so, correct? Well, you didn't really give me a time frame when you asked me that question. It was well, I didn't global. Say immediately after the breakup, didn't I? I don't remember that. Okay. Okay. You also said that you don't recall your son being angry with Megan after the breakup. Do you remember just saying that? Yeah. I'm going to show you State's Exhibit number 63 and show you a message that your son wrote to you on January 19th, which is about a week after she left it. I listened to you, Mother. I'm really back on the right track. I'm doing we. I presume he means well. I just want her to go away. Please put this bitch in her place. She changed her cell number, but her email is obviously still active. And then he gives you her email address. Excuse me, email address as well as her street address. I see that. Would you would you describe that email as an angry email or angry text message? Part of it. Okay. So, w which part of that would you not describe as being angry? I've listened to the first part. I've listened to you, mother. I'm really back on the right track. I'm doing well, I guess. But we both agree that put this bitch in her place is pretty angry. It sounds angry. This is 
again, back to the 14th, which is two days after Megan left in. And if you can reduce it just a little more so I can get the entire text. Yes, sir. Me too. Please. There is no... We don't have the entire text. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, just, I'm, I'm only going to be asking about this line oh, right here. Yes, sir. Um, State Exhibit 61. This is to your son on the 14th of January again. There is no excuse for your bad behavior. Same song you always sing. What is Matt in reference to? You know, I honestly don't remember what specifically. It, it's a year and a half. I don't remember exactly why I said that. Well, what is the same song you always sing? Yes, I don't want to object to this question to character and goes far beyond the scope of direct examination of Ms. Jacob. Well, Judge, I mean, this is the, she said in the direct aftermath of her son and Megan breaking up, she didn't recall him being angry. This is part of the same conversation. It's all. I still don't remember what we were talking about specifically. Okay, and I just wanted to be clear one more time. You had a client in a contentious divorce case who talked to you about taking a contract out on her then husband's life, and you didn't report it as you'd be, as you'd be obligated to do by professional standards, correct? The way you phrase object and non-responsive judge. Try to answer the question. No. Let me re-ask the question okay. again, okay? During your representation of Valerie McDaniel, your testimony is she told you about a desire to take out a contract to kill her then husband, correct? Yes. And you did not report that pursuant to the rules of your professional duties. Is that correct? Uh, yes or no, as far, Well, wait a second. As far as the rules of professional duty, I'd like to see that what particular rule he's talking about when an individual client tells a lawyer something that um, uh, is perhaps part of the attorney-client privilege. I'd like to see the particular rule he's talking about. Mm -hmm. If you wish to proceed in these, this, this line of questioning. Well, can, can, I ask, can, can I ask the witness? Sorry, not Sorry. If you want to continue, I need to see the, the same rule that the defense is asking for. Otherwise, move on. I'll pass the witness, Judge. Thank you. Anything further, Mr. Parker? Yes, just a couple of questions. Um, was there any money issue uh, involved with uh, with Megan and and McDaniel? Megan McDaniel? Did no. Is there any was there any money issue involved in 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 the in the divorce proceeding? Oh yes. And would you basically explain the circumstances surrounding that issue? I'm just a relevance judge. The financial details of Valerie's and Max divorce, I don't think it's relevant. Unless you can show me relevance, I have to sustain the objection. You know, it just, you know, goes to, for instance, motive. Uh, it's part of this whole circumstance um, surrounding this, uh, the relationship uh, between Golda uh, and uh, Valerie and McDaniel. And I think that uh, it's something that the jury needs to consider. What? And besides that, Your Honor, it's already in evidence. What is in evidence? Answer that. If I may, Your Honor, they brought in the fact that Valerie McDaniel had a divorce account from Mac McDaniel into the bank records when they brought in, I think it was Brendan Rogers, who testified today about that account and money coming out of that account. Ask your question then, Mr. Parham, please. Yes, Your Honor. Was there any issue regarding monies uh, in the divorce proceeding? Yes. And what was the issue? The issue was a veterinary clinic and the real estate that the clinic was housed in. Uh, and um, Dr. McDaniel, Valerie, who was a veterinarian, she wanted the clinic. And Mr. McDaniel, who did not have a veterinary degree, wanted the clinic. Um, and that was the biggest argument over the divorce. You, you 
you say he wanted the clinic or won the clinic? He wanted to have the clinic for himself. All right. Go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Which is prohibited by Texas law in any case because only a veterinarian. I pass the witness. Thank you. Just a few questions, Judge. Um, now, ma'am, uh, you weren't present for any of these conversations that your son had with any undercover officer or um, a guy named Motaz Aziz during January or February, March 2017, were you? No, sir. So you have no personal knowledge whether your son helped Valerie McDaniel or assisted her in any way in contracting for the death of Mac McDaniel? No, sir. I'll pass away, sir. I may have one moment. Do you have any idea of how much money Valerie had to pay um, in an abortion proceeding? Yes. I think it's relevant. That was in excess of $1.2 million. I'm sorry? It was in excess of $1.2 million. And that money was paid to whom? To Mr. McDaniel by Valerie. And, of course, Mr. McDaniel didn't have to pay Valerie anything, correct? That's correct. Now, are there text messages, if you know, from Megan to you asking for money? Objective, objective here, it. Sustain. Um, are you aware of any uh, efforts on the part of Megan to obtain money from you. Can you give me a time frame? Um, Check the relevance again, Judge. Sustain. Anything else? Yes. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Next witness, please. Yes, call. Um, Paul Yanovich, Your Honor, and I believe we have a. Was that your first? Jerry, Jr. All right, ladies and gentlemen, need to take a short break. Have you back out in a minute? All rise for the jury. My name is Dr. Al Yanovitz, and the doctor is an academic degree, not a medical degree. All right, and. Uh, Tell us about your educational background, sir. I have a bachelor's degree in speech, hearing, and language science from the uh, Kent State University in Ohio, and a master's and a PhD in acoustics from the University of Connecticut in 1973. I'm sorry, sir, did you say linguistics? Uh, no, in acoustics. Acoustics, I'm sorry. <clears throat> acoustics in this room, not that. <laughs> All right. Go ahead, sir. Um, I received my Ph.D. in 1973 from the University of Connecticut. Have you uh, ever given any um, forensic presentation, sir? Yes, I routinely uh, present at a number of societies having to do with speech, hearing, and language sciences, uh, probably on the order of about 8 to 10, 12 presentations a year. And how long has that been going on? Uh, probably the last 25 to 30 years. All right. Um, and are these presentations national? Most all of them are national and international. Uh, have you testified uh, in state and federal courts throughout the United States concerning audio evidence? Yes, I have many times. And. Would you consider yourself to be an audiologist? Sorry, could you repeat that? Yes, are you an audiologist? Yes, in a clinical domain, I am an audiologist to treat people with hearing loss. Uh, have you testified um, concerning autistic evidence? Yes. Both civil and criminal? Yes, both of them. And as a matter of fact, you have been um, you have worked with uh, the Houston Police Department, have you not? 
many, many times. And in what capacity? Uh, many times uh, I have uh, helped the police department in terms of its surveillance issues. Uh, I've worked with uh, a number of uh, police officers in the homicide division, especially having to do with investigating cases where there's acoustic evidence. Have you worked with the Harris County District Attorney's Office? Numerous times. And in what capacity? Uh, I testified a great number of times in cases in, which involved um, Rusty Harden, uh, Chuck Rosenthal, and a number of assistant district attorneys, usually always with uh, acoustic evidence and speech language or hearing science. Have you ever been uh, Daubert challenged in federal court for your authenticity procedures? In the area of voice identification, I have, and authenticity as well. And uh, what was the outcome of that issue? Case. Um, in a number, uh, I've testified hundreds of times having to do with acoustic issues in forensic sciences. Um, there was a time 20 years ago or more when uh, um, issues in voice identification and speaker identification was very controversial, and uh, I represented the academic community on those aspects. And uh, there were times, maybe once, when the judge refused to allow any expert testimony, invoice identification, and um, there was one trial uh, that I felt I was not allowed to testify in uh, because of that same issue. Uh, and in the areas of expertise, uh, have you authored peer-reviewed publications? Could you repeat the last part of what you sure. said? Sure. Have you authored peer-reviewed publications? Yes, many, many times. I continue to do that still to this day. All right. What were you uh, – pardon me, do you have a partner? Yes. Um, his name is uh, Mr. Herbert Joe. He's a lawyer as well. And uh, – your firm is Yanovich and Joe, correct? That's correct. Where is that located? In Dallas, Texas. All right. Um, and what were you asked to do in this case? In this case, I was asked to review uh, a great voluminous amount of, of audio information, some of it video uh, recording as well. I was asked to look at text messages. I was given the whole... A uh, lot of uh, the um, evidentiary material that was recorded material. I was asked to uh, specifically uh, assimilate that material. I was asked to collate it. Uh, there were um, a great number of times through the uh, hours and hours of conversations where um, Mr. Jacob made commentary about what his intention was with Megan. And I was asked to take those conversations and to organize them, not to linguistically interpret them, uh, but instead to put them in a manner that would allow um, perhaps a jury to understand the structure of what was said during the time uh, that those indications by Mr. Jacob were made. <clears throat> Your Honor, I would tender uh, Mr. Yanovich as an expert uh, audiologist and would ask that he be permitted to testify in front of this jury. Thank you, Judge. Uh, so, Doctor, your testimony is, is it, you're, and I'm sorry, it's a doctor, correct? Could you repeat that? Your, your doctor, your PhD? Do, your doctor. Your, yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, you're, so, you're your testimony here today would be essentially telling the jury about statements that have been recorded in another, in, in a fashion that they're organized by you in a different way. That's only part of it. Okay, uh, and, I, and I see that. I, th I see that you um, you have a report as well, correct? Yes. Sixty-six. Yes, sir. I'm marking states sixty-six. And I'll, uh, I'll 
I'll show you Dr. State 66 and tell me whether or not this is your final report in this case. Yes, it is. And we'd offer state 66 for purposes of this hearing, Judge. Objection. For the purpose of the hearing or for the purposes of this hearing? For the purpose of the hearing, 66 is And when you said that's only part of it, what exactly would be your testimony regarding your reorganization of, of the recorded statements? Well, there, was, there were two two comments made by the, what was. I would like the opportunity to tell you what the other part was, but to answer your question specifically, um, by organizing the material, I simply was able to extract the material from the voluminous amount of recordings, to put them into topical areas not excluding anything, as Mr. Parnum had said, find anything and everything that existed in those conversations where Mr. Jacob is, is commenting on what should happen to Megan. Don't just state the positive and good things for him, state everything. So I did that. I also noticed that a number of conversations where important material existed uh, was masked by uh, environmental noise or competing sounds that would make it difficult for anyone to understand truly the words. So I was able to do a digital enhancement procedure uh, acceptable to the scientific community that would uh, reduce the background noise and let you more easily understand the words. And I did that with care so as not to um, make it um, a product where any of the words were modified or changed or can be mis misperceived. And did you make a copy of that enhanced version? Your Honor, this goes beyond the boundaries of the Dalbert proceeding, it goes to the qualifications of the individual to testify as an expert. This is well beyond what those uh, parameters are as far as Dalbert's concerned. I think you're going into the details of what you did. So I kind of sus I will sustain the objection. Let's keep it specifically to what Dalbert entails as to. So, if, if I'm a, if I'm understanding correctly, you enhance the audio on the recordings you receive. Where it was needed, yes. And you search for certain words or phrases uh, that you could find regarding what the defendant said about what he wanted done with Megan. Correct. I did not imply any intent to what he, uh, what, what he was suggesting to be done with Megan, only what his words clearly indicated. Okay, when you say what words clearly indicated, you're, you're drawing a conclusion, aren't you? Yes. This is well beyond Dalbert. We've well, established his qualifications and to testify, this is a material that the jury, judge, if I may, and if, 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 if it's, it's discovery as far as the state's concerned, it's asked, it's cross-examination which should be done in front of the jury. Well, this is simple, simply discovery for the state. Well, I, do, I, I, do, I appreciate that, but I disagree. I think the state has a right to understand what it is that he's going to offer the jury. As to and whether or not whatever it is he's offering the jury, is something that is needed for the jury to make a decision in this case. So that's overruled. Continue. So what I'm understanding is you have taken out certain phrases or statements and then you have reorganized them in some way for a presentation. I reorganized it in, a, in its chronological form following the time train that it existed, um, but I was able to just extract the statements and um, collate them together. When you, let me stop you. When you say you use Your Honor, words, Excuse me. Your Honor, this we've established, I take it, that he is an expert and will be permitted to testify in front of the jury. I'm not sure what he's an expert in. Audiology, Your Honor. That's which what he testified is, to. Which I heard it once. What is it again? Well, audiology is the clinical application of acoustics 
but I am most I am an acoustics expert and deal with uh, evidentiary material that's been recorded on a routinely basis in courts. Can I continue, Judge? Hey, you're no. on a, what I'd like to have is a, 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 a ruling by the court as to whether or not he meets the qualifications of Dalbert, and then the state can continue to do whatever it wants. Well, we're not there yet. Point. Right. We, you know, only it's only one step that he's an expert. There's several other steps besides saying, okay, this person's an expert. There are more steps than just that involved. I'm trying to understand what he's an expert in. Well, now he's saying he's an expert in acoustics. I'm not Doctor, would you explain for the court what an expert in acoustics is? Yes. Well, there are <clears throat> a number of aspects of uh, being an acoustic expert. One of them um, considers for example, transcription. Another considers enhancement when the material is very difficult to understand and the environmental or background noise has to be reduced. Another aspect of forensic acoustics is voice identification. Another topic would be authenticity. And I've been uh, succeeded in a Daubert challenge in, in authenticity analysis and do that on a routine basis so in testimony then that you're called upon to say there's a recording, can't really make out who's saying what or what it is they're saying, and your expertise says this is the person that's speaking and this is what they said when it's not otherwise audible to a jury? That is correct. And is that what you're here to testify about? Uh, I did that in a great number of the exemplars that I selected from the taped material. That would be, that's why I asked the question to you earlier, Doctor. Did you make a copy of the enhanced version that you said you made in this case? I copied out selections uh, that were determined by me to be related to what Mr. Jacob uh, indicated he wanted to have happen to Megan. Okay, let's stop that. Are there, I didn't realize there were any critical areas of the audio portions of these tapes that there was any major differences as to what was said that was crucial to the case. Now, if that is the situation, then I would be inclined to allow the doctor to uh, testify as to what he believes was said and by whom. But unless we have that dispute, I don't see the necessity of what this person is going to add to anything. Mr. Porter? Yes, Your Honor. Previously, we had a dispute concerning transcripts, and uh, the state, we approached the bench. I know that. And, and, and that, that, that was a dispute, and I think that that... So, is he going to testify to that? Well, I think he's going to testify as to uh, information that uh, I tendered to him uh, concerning the identity of individuals, uh, what one person said, uh, and the context in which they said it. And I think that's important for the jury to hear. I'm not sure I understand the context of what they're saying. That sounds to me like an interpretation of what they meant, and I don't believe that's what he's saying he does. Hey, I have them again. Well, I'll ask you, is that what you do? Did you listen to what somebody says and you're able to testify as to what their intent was? No, I'm not doing that. I'm not presenting material on what the intent was. But there are a great uh, difference. There is a, uh, a, a large amount of um, not necessarily ambiguity, but there is a large amount of differentiation between um, what Mr. Jacob has said. And to put that in organization without interpretation, without modifying, is a, gr a great asset to the jury, I believe. Uh, I'm going to show you the conclusions that are listed in your report, Doctor. Um, and let's start with number one. These are your conclusions, correct? Yes. Leon Jacob was always under the impression that he and the undercover officer had made arrangements for the undercover officer to relocate Megan to Pittsburgh. That was one of your conclusions. That's correct. Are you a psychologist, sir? No. Okay. That That is a conclusion that you drew as an expert in the field of audio. That's a conclusion that I drew from the conversation that Mr. Jacob had with the undercover officer, yes. Let me stop. If this is what you're saying, then I don't 
this is where we're heading with this witness, who's a, an expert in acoustics. This is well beyond to me what an expert is, and I've never encountered one. But I would think, based on what this witness has told me, this is well beyond what his expertise is in. He's drawing conclusions now of what someone intended, what they implied, what was, and I'm, you know, that's the, that invades the providence of the jury, and I would be not inclined to allow anyone to get on the stand and say, well, in my opinion, this is what he meant. He's not a psychiatrist, he's not a psychologist, he's an acoustics expert. So if that's what we got, then I'm not inclined to allow the testimony. If he wants to testify about, here's some garble, we can't understand what it is, and he's amplified it, and here's what was actually said, then I'm fine with it. But when we start saying, well, I put it all together, and here's what I think he meant, nope, that's not going to happen. Could we ask Judge Levy to provide a copy of this so-called enhanced audio that he's going to draw his conclusions from? Well, if he's actually going to testify now, given the fact that I'm now limiting him to testify solely to deciphering garbled language that cannot otherwise be understood by any of the parties or the jury. And, and that's my issue, Judge, is that he's talking about an enhanced version he made from which he's going to make those statements. That has not been made available to me. From what I understand, that is not available to me. I'm not able to have my own expert review his enhanced version. He's, he's basically telling the jury what his belief is that is said on the audio. And I think best evidence rule dictates that the jury decides whether they can truly make out what's being said or not. There's no, there, I can't review his materials. Thank you so much. I'm not stupid. I agree. Uh, if this has not already been provided to the state so that they've had an opportunity to have their own expert agree or disagree with his interpretation of what was said, I will not allow his testimony, period. What else do we have? Or a uh, final report uh, from Dr. Yanovich uh, earlier today to the prosecutor. We just, it's been a very short period of time since we've seen the uh, final report from Dr. Yanovich. Well, I would suggest then, given the fact that I'm not going to allow this person to testify, you want to enter that as an exhibit uh, for the appellate record, you're more than happy to do so, but I, I'm not inclined to allow this this witness to testify about his opinions as to what he meant nor the interpretation he understands of what was said since the state has not been previously provided with the, uh, his opinions as to what any kind of blood or inaudible uh, sound bites on the tape. If I may, Your Honor, he will not be getting into his own conclusions of what he That's believes. exactly, I mean, how can you say that? I've just seen what he's saying. He is doing that. We will not allow him to go into that, Your Honor, but he has taken a great chunk of the material that's been played for this court, and Your Honor, yourself. Okay. Well, so then you're under an obligation, I believe, uh, since you have to provide the estate with uh, your experts' names and stuff like that, which you've done, I assume. But, you know, also, uh, if he's going to get up here and say, here's what the inaudible testimony says, the state certainly had a right, or has a right to see that in advance so that they, in turn, can have their own experts agree to disagree. They've not had that opportunity. Uh, it would be unfair prejudice to the state, and I won't allow it. And that's it, period. Let's move on. Thank you for your, your time, Dr. Yerkeski. Thank you. We were told that we would not have a copy of the state transcript, and we may have made that request early on. That, that's not true. That's well, not it true. is true. No, if he had asked me for a copy of my transcript, I most certainly would have provided it. I was never asked for a copy of my transcript. Well, this is a totally different matter, uh, Mr. Farmer. You know, personally, to make everyone's job easier, both of you should have got together and said, let's get one transcript and agree on it. That wasn't done. 
And so we wasted all this time. That should have been done. Now, you're saying the state didn't give you a copy of theirs. I don't know if you gave them a copy of yours. But that has nothing to do with this person testifying as to what his interpretation of the transcript is. If the state has not previously had an opportunity to, to review that in advance. But well, what am I going to do? The state's going to stand up there, and we need time to see if we agree or not agree, and let's continue for two weeks until we get that done. It's not going to happen. Let's move on, please. May we approach briefly? How do we have to approach, Paul? All right. We have one witness, Your Honor, uh, from the medical center. I anticipated that Dr. Yanovich would take probably the rest of the day very closely. That witness will be here at 3.30. And no, I'm not going to wait 30 minutes. Mr. Corn, well, I it's, told the it's state actually I'm, 20 minutes, Judge. Well, I've got 3.04. You know, I told the state, I thought I made it very clear, I don't want to wait on witnesses. If you, if you have another witness, uh, uh, let's go out of order, and then when your witness gets here, if you want to stop, Take that witness off the stand and put him back on again. Thank you, Your So, who is it you're going to call? Ready? Can I have a few minutes with my lawyer, please? The report of Al Yanovich. Six. Defense six was not admitted, so it's seven. Defense seven. Defense seven. Uh, the next number. Defense yes. Uh, for the purpose of the appellate record. Correct. Any objection? No, sir. It's admitted for the purpose of the appellate record. Do you have that? Okay. All right. Next witness, please. Yes, Judge. I will. I will offer this at this time. Sorry, we're doing what? Offering three. Putting it to the right because of the report. It's always getting admitted. Okay, but I'll put it. Once you let Mr. Hornham have it with the understanding that he's going to make a clear clean copy. All right, your next witness, please. Yes, Judge. Yeah, I have to pee. I have to go to the restroom. Jacob, but uh, he, the defendant, but he uh, would like to have a moment uh, to go to the restroom. And of course he can, but it seemed like he could have asked that question 10 minutes ago. I apologize. So let's make please. Your testimony before the court, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth of God. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Jerry. Mr. Parham, please. Thank you, Your Honor. State your name for the ladies and gentlemen of this jury. Leon. Leon Jacob. And Mr. Jacob, uh, you're the defendant in this case, are you not? I am. And you realize you're charged with solicitation of capital murder? Yes, I do. And um, I have been representing you for how many months, you know? Approximately one year. Okay. Um, Mr. Jacob, uh, give the give your background to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury. What, uh, for instance, um, We've heard that you are a doctor. My educational background, as you're asking? Yes. Um, I attended Phillips Exeter Academy for high school in New Hampshire. I went to the University of Texas uh, in Austin for college. 
I attended St. George's Medical School, um, and that's I got my medical degree. In 2005, I graduated. You're going to have to speak up a little louder so that we can all hear you. I graduated medical school in 2005. From where? From St. George's Medical School. And where is that located? It's located, it's a conglomerate between the British UK and the United States. It's, it's part of the education that takes place in Grenada, and the rest of it took place in New York City. And uh, have you practiced medicine? Yes. And what, what area have you practiced? I was a general surgery resident for a total of four years in and out of uh, my training. Um, I did two transplant fellowships, one in um, left ventricular assist devices uh, and heart transplantation at St. Uh, St. Luke's uh, Texas Heart here in Houston, and I did another fellowship in um, kidney and uh, pancreas transplantation at the University of Texas uh, Houston as well. You've heard uh, some testimony during the course of this case that uh, you were in the military, have you not? I've heard that, yes. Were you? No. You've heard some testimony that uh, you had indicated that you had been down to Guantanamo uh, and assisted individuals that had been um, wounded uh, so that they could be rehabilitated for the purposes of, um, of uh, being tortured and giving testimony or giving evidence. You've heard that. Those statements were recorded, yes. All right. Are those statements true or not true? No. Uh, the statements that uh, you are attributed to making, um, did you in fact make those statements? You heard them on the tapes, yes. I made them to the police officer. All right. And what was the purpose of you making those grandiose statements? I think at the time, given the fact that the two of us had been drinking uh, together and the fact that he was talking very much about how he kills people for a living or he intimidates people, and then when I saw his gun, um, it, I became very fearful and I think it was more bravado than anything else, trying to bolster myself up uh, with him. Uh, I'm not accustomed to being around firearms. I don't own one, never have. Um, and uh, when he lifted his shirt up, I think that really upset me a great deal. Um, and I was trying to sort of play a, a part equal to his, if you will. Um, that's about the best I can explain it. Okay. Now, um have you been married before? I have. And do you have children? I do. How old are the kids? Uh, my oldest son, James, uh, turns nine next month, so he's still eight. And my uh, youngest son, Cash, uh, he is five and a half. He'll turn six uh, in July. Do you see the children? Uh, prior to my incarceration, I saw them uh, very often, about once every two or three weeks. All right. And yeah. I also FaceTime with them, you know, four to five days a week uh, in the evenings for, you know, varying lengths of time, depending on what their attention span was. What was the name of your ex-wife? Her name uh, was Annie Jacob. Now it's Annie Morrison. All right. Annie Morrison? Yes, sir. And uh, who, who was Valerie McDaniel? Well, to me or just in general? No, well, let's talk about it in general. Uh, Valerie McDaniel was a, uh, a woman who uh, was a veterinarian, and um, my girlfriend uh, or common law wife, I guess, if we qualified for that, uh, right. towards the end of her death, she uh, was a lot of things. I, I don't really sure what you're asking. All right. Well, uh, to you personally, you were together romantically, correct? Yes. Uh, for how long a period of time? Um, we lived together for about three or two and a half months. 
but we had been romantically involved for quite some time uh, more than that. How much time, approximately? Um, probably a couple of years. Now, um, can I re retract my last statement? It was not a continuous uh, relationship. We had had an interlude uh, in 2014, and then there was a long break where we were just friends. And then, you know, after um, I broke up with my former girlfriend, we rekindled the romantic or part of the relationship. Former girlfriend was whom? Uh, a woman by the name of Megan Louise Barakis. All right. And you've heard Megan testify in this court? I have. All right. Now, uh, tell the ladies and gentlemen of this jury uh, about your relationship with Megan. When did you start? We met. Um, during my divorce proceedings, I lived in a couple of hotels in Pittsburgh. I lived in the Wyndham Grand for quite some time, and I decided to move hotels, and I was given a referral uh, to a place called the Cambria Suites, uh, which is right next to the console center where the Penguins play, and it, I checked in there, um, I think, in the beginning of uh, 2014, sometime in early January, and I met Megan there. Okay. And uh, tell the ladies and gentlemen of this jury uh, about uh, Mac McDaniel. Had you ever met him? I met him a couple of times uh, when he lived next door to my mother. Uh, I think once when I came down to visit, and then once when I moved down here, I stayed with my mother for, I, moved, I re moved back to, um, to Houston in 2014. I, I stayed with my mother for a couple weeks, uh, maybe three or four weeks actually, maybe more like a month. And um, I had run into him a couple times on the street. No real interactions, just a friendly, high neighbor, you know, kind of thing. Okay. So you didn't socialize with him? Absolutely not. And you didn't uh, uh, go to his employment or vice versa? No, I was, uh, I knew nothing about him. I'm at sorry? The, at the time, I knew nothing about him except for he was supposedly um, Valerie's husband, although he was seemed to never be around very much. Um, the few times I did see him, he drove into the house and would leave shortly thereafter. And uh, was he married at the time? To Valerie, yes. Okay. Now, tell the ladies and gentlemen of this jury uh, about the uh, split, the initial split that you had with Megan. We, what happened? I'll, I'll get there. Um, we had had a, a pretty heated argument uh, the night of January 12th of 2017. Um, the argument started over the fact that um, sort of by accident I had discovered that she had been moving money out of our uh, joint checking account for quite some time um, into somewhere else or she was taking cash uh, withdrawals and I confronted her about that, and we had a, you know, a really bad fight. I, approximately how much money did you, approximately? It was several thousand dollars. I, I really hadn't discovered a lot at that time because, you know, it was kind of shocking to me that what was going on. I have since, after that, found, you know, more. But the initial thing that took my attention was there was a $500 paycheck that she wrote to herself out of our personal account on um, January 5th of uh, 2017. Um, subsequently, the day I came back from visiting my children in Chicago, she picked me up at the airport and 
you know, things seem fine. It's just fine. Well, well, I'm sorry. I sustained the objections. So yes, I understand. understand. Uh, you indicated that things seem fine between you and Megan. Yes, you know we had this fight, but um, I, prior to the fight, I had discovered that she had been taking money out of our joint checking account, and it was, you know, quite upsetting that I had discovered that. Taking her, those deposits or withdrawals was without your knowledge at the time it happened and without your consent. Yes, it was a joint checking account. She had the right to do that. I have to preface that the statement with that. But Megan had handled all the the bills. She was she was very responsible with paying bills on time and you know paying our rent on time. And uh, I, I really did not get involved in the finances too much. We both put money into the account, but I sort of was very happy to let her stay out, or for myself to stay out of that. She was very organized when it came to our finances, so, you know, I trusted her. It was, I found out sort of by accident. Yeah. So question and answer, please. What did you find out by accident? I had put on our home computer and she had been logged into um, our banking account and when it, uh, the screen, I saw the screen, I just clicked on some checks. I, don't, I was just looking at the stuff that was on there, and I, I noticed the check that she'd written to herself. It was bizarre. And did you have an argument about that? Yes, that's what the argument, precipitated the argument, yes. All right, and we've heard uh, testimony that she moved out. She left that evening. She left all of her belongings there, um, so I, she didn't move out that night. Um, okay. In fact, I moved all my stuff out about four days later. And did you also move some of her stuff out? No, I left her clothes, you know, anything that she, was hers, I, I left there as far as I didn't touch any of her clothes or any, any of her toiletries or anything. I took my clothing and I took our furniture. In a later time, you got back together with her, correct? No. Not after January 12th. All right. Now, uh, let's go to the uh, whole allegation of solicitation of capital murder. Okay. Um, you know who the party is that you're accused of soliciting to murder? Are you talking about the undercover officer? Correct. Yes. All right. Now, um, were you a party to conversations with the undercover officer? Yes. And do you know whether or not those record? were you told that they were being recorded? I had no idea they were being recorded at the time I had the conversations with him. When was the first time you had a conversation with the undercover officer? I met him at the Olive Garden on, um, I think it was March... 7th of uh, 2017. All right. Tell me about that meeting that's been talked about a lot. Tell me your version of the meeting. Judge, I'm going to object. This calls for a narrative. It does. What's the next place? What, uh, what was the first time at the Olive Garden when you met with the undercover officer? Outside of the restaurant, um, I had, Valerie and I had arrived before they did, so we, we were sitting by a booth I could see out to the front, and when they arrived, I met them, I think, outside in the front and showed them where we were sitting. Um, I met him either right there or right after he got into the restaurant. What was the purpose of that meeting from your perspective? It was to... It was to finalize some plans that I had had with um, somebody I thought to be a private investigator um, who we called Zach or Abraham, uh, who has been identified in court here as um, Motaz Aziz. Um, he had told Valerie and I that some of the things that we had discussed with him that 
he'd become too close to us. Sustain. Sorry. Uh, how long did that meeting last? Uh, I don't know, like an hour, hour and a half. Um, I can rephrase my previous answer if you'd like. Sorry. Did you pay for the check or did they pay for the check? Or? I think we picked the tab up, yeah. Okay. Uh, when is the next time you saw the undercover officer? At Valerie and I's apartment. Um, I think the day after uh, the meeting with um, the, the Olive Garden. Okay. Now, there was money they exchanged hands, correct, at some point? At some point, uh, yes, the officer was given some money. And what was the purpose of that? I had received a phone call from the undercover at some point, and I'm not sure that we've heard that phone call here in court today, but he had told me that he needed some expense money. Um, Sustain. Were you of the impression that uh, you needed to give him money for expenses? He had said that. So I, I apologize. Um, Just try to listen to the question and answer it if you can. Yes, Your Honor. I was under the impression that he needed money for expenses and he wanted a um, advance on what we had agreed to pay him for some services. And what were the services that you agreed to pay him? I'm not 100%. At the time, I was not 100% of what those services were because Valerie had made that negotiation with him. All right. And as a matter of fact, at the time the money was paid, were you present or were you out of the room? I was present, but I did not hand him the money. It was on a it was on the table covered by some laundry. At some point in time, there was a discussion uh, that's been testified to you or by you, not by you, but by the undercover officer uh, about the discussion that he had with Valerie about her ex. Do you recall that? I do. And did you participate in that discussion? I did not. What did you exactly do to extract yourself from that conversation? I left the table. Um, I was previously, previous to them talking, Valerie had, them even coming to the restaurant, Valerie had said she wanted to talk to Aziz and um, the guy we called Adam, we met as Adam by herself. And that she said that when it she wanted to talk to them that I, she'd ask me to leave the, the restaurant. And did you? I did. Uh, did you actually leave the restaurant or did you just leave the table? And no, I left the, the physical space. I went out to the parking lot. All right. Um, You've heard some testimony here that you had conversations with uh, the undercover officer, Duran, about uh, wanting to kill um, uh, Megan and McDaniel. That's correct. All right. Uh, tell us your recollection of the content of those conversations, if they in fact occurred. Well, I can't really give you a recollection of something that didn't happen. I never asked anybody to kill anybody. Um, does the word kill, hurt, harm in any way, shape, or form appear in any of those recorded conversations? Not on my behalf. I'm sorry? Except for to exclude them from things I want done. I never asked to have anybody hurt, killed, harmed. Um, kidnapped or uh, I never asked for anybody to be in any way physically hurt did you pay money at all for this purpose no all right. well there was no purpose for me to pay money towards anybody being hurt because I never asked for that 
Now, we've heard testimony about there being money that had been, um, I believe, transmitted to Megan or to the undercover officer. Uh, what was the purpose of giving the money to the undercover officer as far as Megan's concerned? It had nothing to do with Megan um, at all. Who did it have to deal with? It had to do with an advance payment on what Valerie and the undercover officer had agreed upon because of expenses that he needed to hotel and whatnot. And for the time that he was there, he had explained to me that. Um, well, it, had going into your say. it had nothing to do with monies to Megan for her expenses to leave, correct? No, that had been paid um, previously to Aziz. And how much money was paid to Aziz? He was given um, initially a $2,500 payment for the initial investigation that I had hired him to do. Um, he was given an additional $5,000 uh, for continued expenses during that investigation. He was given a little over $5,000 for a moving company receipt that he had showed me um, that it arranged for Megan's stuff to be moved um, back to Pittsburgh. He had given me a receipt for a Continental Airlines ticket, uh, first class one way, that was a little over 700 and change. I had given him $1,000 for that. And then he had told me that he thought it was appropriate to give Megan some money to re start her life in Pittsburgh, and I asked him how much, um, and the sum of $10,000 in cash was um, agreed upon, which he received. And the 10000 went to Aziz as opposed to Megan? That was how it was arranged, yes. I was under the impression that Aziz was uh, in contact with Megan um, on a semi-regular basis. Well. But my question is, was the money given to Aziz for Aziz or to be given to Megan? It was to be given to Megan. The monies that were given to Aziz for Aziz were the initial $2,500 that he received, plus the additional $5,000 for what I thought were his services. Do you know if, in fact, he gave money to Megan for this purpose? I have learned. Um, in testimony that we've heard in court that that did not occur. Did what? It did not occur. Do you want me to rephrase my... I've learned during testimony and during the course of this entire process that, um, in fact, Aziz had never even spoken to Megan and therefore she never received any of these monies that were supposed to go to her. All right. Um, did you ever pay money to an undercover officer uh, for the purpose of harming or hurting either Megan or May Daniel? No. Did you ever discuss that issue with the undercover officer? We had, yes, we had multiple discussions or multiple conversations about not wanting to harm or hurt anybody. And that was something that you had expressed, correct? Repeatedly. All right. And as a matter of fact, the jury's heard testimony where uh, you in a conversation talked about, I don't want anybody hurt, um, I don't want anybody harmed, things of this fashion, correct? Absolutely. In fact, I've read the transcripts. This goes into narration. I'm sorry, Your Honor. I have in their entirety. In what transcripts uh, are you referring to? Of the audio tapes that were provided uh, well, to you by the prosecution via the police uh, from their undercover investigation. And was there anything? Uh, on the audio tapes suggesting kill, harm, hurt Megan or McDaniel? 
No. In fact, um, 177 times during these, trans these conversations do I say the words, I don't want to harm or hurt or kill anybody. Okay. Are you sure, um, how did you get uh, into a relationship with Motaz? I received a phone call from him um, sometime in late January or early February of uh, 2017. And what was the content of that phone call? Sustain. What did you tell Motaz uh, during the conversation? I told him that I would appreciate to meet with him. Um, he had details of what had been going on from a woman named Laura Thurlow and um, she had told me that he was going to call me and he did. Right. And Laura Thurlow testified in this court a couple of days ago, right? Yes, sir. And um, during the course of your relationship with Laura Thurlow, um, did you hear any testimony about um, Megan being placed in a car under sedation um, by way of uh, some type of a needle that you would provide? I did. And uh, did you hear her testify that, that the purpose of that was for you to be able to get control of the situation uh, so that you could be with Megan? I did, but I deny ever making those suggestions to Laura Thurlow. You deny what? Ever making those suggestions to Laura Thurlow. Suggestion relating to the syringe? Absolutely. And suggestions uh, relating to you uh, wanting to be back in touch with uh, or back as a couple with Megan? I do not deny those suggestions. You do not deny them? No, but I deny the suggestion that I ever asked Laura Thurlow to somehow inject Megan Varicus with a needle to sedate her. Um, in fact, those were suggestions from Laura Thurlow to me, and I was very emphatic that I did not want that to happen. All right. Uh your feelings about Megan, uh, you love her? I did. Did you love her through this period of time that you've heard testimony about, uh, uh, about, you know, uh, having her and McDaniel uh, killed? It's a difficult question to answer. I think that when you give your heart to somebody for such a long time, that part of you always still loves them. You know, when we broke up, it was, you know, fairly volatile breakup and a surprise to me. Um, and after some time, I realized that she was, there was no getting back with her. And I think that, um, you know, I had to accept that. But you tried. I did try to get back with her, yes. I mean, you see, you've seen these emails. Absolutely. And the emails all consist of your love for her. They do. And your desire to get back together again. They do. Did she respond to that? Um, not so much. Just asked me to sort of leave her alone. Um, Why did I, you leave her alone? In hindsight, I, you know, probably should have, but I just didn't understand how you could become so entwined in someone's life and uh, just walk away so easily uh, from their life, especially considering we were really happy. Um, I know that she testified. Uh, 
what? That it had been a long time come. Yeah, it's awfully broad. I'm she sorry? Just, it's awfully broad question. She testified to a whole lot of things. So yes. So you want to be specific. Um, yeah. Uh, did you, um, is there a particular reason why you would not leave her alone? I think it was a multitude of reasons. I can't put it to, into one reason. Would you categorize your position as being desperate for her? I could categorize it that way. I think to answer your previous question, um, I thought that she really loved me the way that she said she did. And I uh, couldn't imagine ever walking away from her the way she walked away from me just like that. Um, any further questions on this topic? Michael Kubosh. Yes, sir. Um, did you ever visit his office? I did. And what was the purpose of that visit? To have a discussion with him about a man that I had come to know is the name Zach, who has been identified in court as Motaz Aziz. All right. And why did you want to have discussions with, with uh, Kubosh about that, about Zach? I was under the impression that if Motaz Aziz ever disappeared or could not be reached, that Michael Kubosh would be able to find, would know where he was. And why did you need Zach? He was already actively uh, trying, he was already actively portraying a private investigator for me, and uh, he had received a lot of money and all of a sudden just disappeared uh, for a while. Uh, must have been more than about 10, 12 days. So I um, reached out to Michael Kubosh to see if he might be able to locate him. Uh, to at first try to to find out where Megan was after we first broke up. Where she was physically. Physically and, you know, yeah. All right. And thereafter? He had convinced me that he would be able to uh, at first talk to her. He said he was skilled in negotiation. He had been in the military for that interrogation, that kind of stuff, and that he would try to broker a, a meeting between the two of us where we could sit down and sort of talk about what had happened and why it had happened and, you know, give a, me a chance to try to, to reconcile a relationship. Did you ever, were you ever supposed to meet Zach at the Hotel Zaza? Yes. And uh, when was that? That had to be in um, sometime January, late January of 2017. All right. Did you, in fact, meet at the hotel? No, uh, I went to the hotel, but I uh, sat outside per his instructions for several hours without ever hearing from him, so I went home. Okay. You've heard Laura Thurlow talk about uh, you basically watching uh, and following her movements and things of that fashion. Is that correct? I did hear that, yes. Sir? I did hear that, yes. And is, was that her description about your activities uh, during that three-day period, was that basically accurate? It was not totally accurate, no. And what, what is accurate about her testimony? I did drop Laura off near the hotel. She said that she would go in and t try to talk, as she testified, uh, to Megan. Um, I had parked across the street um, waiting for Laura to come out. Um, we had gone back the next day again, as she testified to. But 
Uh, it wasn't as if we were hanging around the hotel for hours at a time. Uh, it was a very brief time that we were there. Um, we spent most of our time um, at a restaurant together. She testified we went there to, to eat. All right. At this time, Your Honor, maybe I'd check to see if that other witness is in the hallway. Your associate can't. Sure. Would you? Um, I think we have an answer. He's right Mr. there. Is he, is he here or not? Yes, sir. He's sitting in the stand, sir. Is the next witness here? Yes. I, well, is he? Not yet. All right. Right, okay. Right yes, here, Governor. In violation of the rule, is that? He just walked in, sir. Okay. That's why I stopped talking. I apologize. Your Honor, we would uh, ask that this testimony be interrupted and have this other individual testify. Ladies and gentlemen, I have an agreement with the defense. Uh, we were waiting on a, a witness for the defense that just got here, and instead of sitting here for 45 minutes while we waited, I, I uh, let Mr. Horning put on. Uh, his client with the understanding that once that witness got here, we would uh, allow Mr. Jacob to take his seat and then proceed with this other witness. So with that, let's take about two minutes, please, and I'll have you right back with All right. I may have one more. Oh, there he is. Briefly, please, yes. Mr. Horn. Testimony before the court will be the fruit, the whole fruit, and nothing but the truth shall be done. I do. Thank you. Um, Brian Buckter, it's a B R I A N, and then B R U C K N E R, Bruckner. All right, Ms. Freeman, please. Please be seated. Well, ladies and gentlemen, change of plans. We thought it would be best to have a continuation of the chain that we're following now instead of breaking it up. So everyone has agreed that we'll continue on with the testimony of Mr. Jacob. Mr. Porter, please. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Jacob, uh, concerning the Z's, um, when did you first meet with him? I can't recall the exact date, but it was sometime in late January of last year. And there were phone calls that preceded your meeting with him, correct? Yes. And who placed those calls? He did. And why did he call you? To initiate a meeting concerning a discussion he wanted to have about a problem that I had. And what was the problem that you had? I had broken up, or my girlfriend and I had broken up, and she um, had sort of disappeared, and I didn't know where she was. I couldn't get in contact with her. I. Megan? Megan Vericus, yes. Were you with Valerie at the time? Um, no, not when I uh, first met with Aziz. All right. And after the phone call, you all arranged for a meeting where? We met at a restaurant over in the Galleria called Del Frisco's. All right. And uh, I believe you testified that that was uh, a meeting that lasted for an hour and a half, two hours? I didn't testify to how long that meeting lasted. All right. How 
How long did it last? About 45 minutes. And what was the context of that meeting? Aziz or Zach, however you want to refer to him from now on, uh, going forward. Zach. Hey, Zach had um, obtained some preliminary information on um, Megan and on um, my family that he uh, sort of showed me. Um, he had extensive files on me and my family and, and stuff about Megan and Megan's family. And who initiated that effort on the part of Zach to get that information? During our initial conversation, he had asked me some names, my name, you know, full name, Megan's full name, my family's full name. Um, he took it upon himself. I don't know how he got the information. I think he's got a background in you know, computer science and he did some internet stuff. I, I don't know how he obtained the information. But he obtained information that confronted you at the time you had a visit, a, a meeting with him at the restaurant. Yeah, looking back and what I know now, it was to appear to be very credible as a private investigator. Credible or not credible? To be very credible. He was presenting himself as somebody who did their homework. All right. And did you ask him to do anything on your behalf? Yes, I asked him to find out where Megan was. All right. And did you pay him any money for that? Not that evening, I did not. Did you later pay him money for that? Yes, the next day. How much did you pay him? I believe it was $2,500 is what he asked for uh, initially. All right. Was he successful in finding out where Megan was? He portrayed that he was. I'm sorry? He portrayed that he was. And how did he portray that he was? He said that he knew where she was staying. Um, he said that uh, he knew, um, you know, about where she worked and, and whatnot, that he'd observed her uh, at work. Uh, you know, I had asked him if... Um, you know, he had talked to her and he said no. And what was the purpose of you wanting him to get to locate Megan? It, initially, well, initially. Excuse me, uh, what's your objection? You want to restate it? I think you have Sure, to Judge. Uh, was he successful in locating Megan? He portrayed that he was. In hindsight, the answer is no. He was making everything up. Initially, I had asked him to find Megan. I was worried about her. She had no access to real money. Did and object to the narrative? Sustained. First and answer, please. Did he find, he found her, correct? He portrayed that he had found her. All right. Was there any money that ever exchanged hands after that meeting between you and Megan? Not directly. How about indirectly? I assume there was through Aziz. And what did you give Aziz? What supports your assumption that he gave money to Megan? $10,000 in cash. When was that delivered? Sometime in February. How much time after the meeting at the restaurant? A couple of weeks. Two or three weeks, I don't remember exactly. Uh, again, these meetings never actually occurred with Megan. He, he, he made me believe that they did. And so you heard testimony from Zach. I did. And you heard that he, in turn, spent the money you gave him. I did. And how much was that? He gave a quote, I think, around $9,980 9, or thereabouts. But he, he took more. Else that you, I'm sorry. He took more than that. Is there anybody else that you know that, uh, that was aware of this meeting and the delivery of cash to, to Zach? Valerie McDaniel was. 
and Valerie was present? She was not present at the initial meeting, no. All right. How, how, does she, how did Valerie McDaniel know about this transfer of money to, uh, to Zach to find Megan? After Megan and I had separated, um, you know, uh, Megan and I didn't have a lot of friends here in Houston. We had a few friends. Um, in fact, Megan and I hung out with Valerie a, a lot, um, and I had called Valerie and told her we had broken up. I'm getting there. Okay. Um, Valerie was somebody I spoke to about what's going on in my life. It, that immediate time, I told her, you know, what was going on, and that I was hiring a private investigator, and whatnot. And so what was that? you were talking about Valerie. I was telling Valerie this stuff as a friend, at first. Yeah, I was telling her what was going on. What was her reaction to the fact that you were trying to find Megan? At first, she was, you know, supported me on that. She what? She supported me initially on that. All right. How did that change? If it did. It did. It changed dramatically. Um, Valerie had told me that she was waiting for... Um, let me answer. Uh, i answer it a different way. Um, okay. Tell me about... Uh, any interaction with McDaniel, either yourself or through Zach? Ever any? Which McDaniel are you referring to? I'm sorry? Which McDaniel are you referring to? Mac McDaniel. I'm not aware of any interaction with myself, with Mac McDaniel, except for I've already described. The only thing that I'm aware of is at some point Aziz called. Um, did Aziz ever call anybody? Yes. Did, it, did he? Did he in fact call McDaniel? I believe so. Yes. All right. That was not in your presence. Did not happen in my presence. All right. Uh, are you guilty of solicitation of capital murder? Absolutely not. Of either McDaniel or Megan? Neither of them. I pass you for cross examination. From the state, please. Mr. Jacob, you like to be in control, don't you? That's not my opinion, it's somebody else's. Well, do you? Who doesn't like to be in control of their life? Let me talk to you about Megan. You told uh, your attorney on direct examination that you were desperate for Megan, right? I guess you can characterize it as that. Well, I didn't say that. You all said that. Did you agree with the statement that you were desperate for Megan? Yes. And that's because you were in love with Megan, right? Yes. And at the time that you all got into that fight, y'all had been in a relationship for a couple of years, correct? Yes. And she actually moved to Houston for you? Yes. And y'all were sharing an apartment? Yes. And the night of the fight, isn't it true that the fight wasn't about finances at all? I told you what it was about. Isn't it true that she was the breadwinner in the family? That's not entirely true. Okay, well, you'd agree with me that you worked for Methodist um, as a contract worker, and that ended in approximately March of 2016, correct? That's false. You disagree with that? Yes. So if I have a piece of paper terminating your contract with Methodist dated March of 2016, you disagree with that? I was paid until the end of May of 2016. So... We'll go with May for you, May 2016, and then the next time that you start bringing in employ any kind of money, you'd agree with me is when you start to work for Charge Financial, correct? No, that's not true. Did you start working for Charge Financial in October of 2017? Of 2016?
2016? No. Well, a little later, maybe. November? November, December time. And things were so bad with your finances that your mom actually gave you money to pay for things, didn't she? Yes. She helped you pay your child support? No. Your mom never paid your child support for you? She may have given checks to me to, to, to pay it, but I always paid it myself to my wife. The Ex money wife. was from your mom, though, wasn't it? It could be characterized as that, yes. Well, if it's your mother's money and she gives it to you to pay the child support, it's coming from your mom, correct? It could be considered more like family money. Family money? So was it family money when your mom pays your cell phone bill? She pays all of our cell phone bills. Is it family money when your mom helps you out when you need groceries? Yes. So when you were upset with Megan from taking money from the account, that's really kind of silly, right? Because she was the only one that was really putting money in the account, correct? No. She had a job at the time, right? Yes. She worked at the hotel, correct? Yes. She was the one who paid your rent. She wrote the checks for the rent, yes. She paid the rent from the money she made at the hotel, correct? Incorrect. She paid for your dog. She bought the dog. Actually, she never paid for the dog. She paid for your groceries. She went to the grocery store, yes. She paid for the groceries. If you mean she went to the store and used our debit card to buy the groceries, then that's correct, yes. Okay. And during the time that Megan lived down here in Houston, she was always employed, correct? That's not correct. And she was always bringing in money to your household, wasn't that's she? That's not correct. And would you agree with me that you all had many fights about the fact that she was frustrated that you didn't have a job? She could, you could characterize it as that, yes. That she was frustrated? Yes. And that she was frustrated that she felt like she was the one that was paying for everything, correct? Those were her opinions, yes. Okay. And she was frustrated because she felt like you were sitting home at the apartment all day and she was the one at work bringing home money, correct? If she wants to characterize it as that, yes. She expressed that to you, correct? A couple of times, yes. And that, that's one of the reasons why you guys would fight, right? Because she felt like the division of what you all were responsible for wasn't fair. That was her opinion. Okay. And she expressed that opinion to you? Sure. And so when she broke up with you that night, she left you after you put your hand on her face, didn't you? I never put my hand on her face. So when you talk, do you remember having a conversation with um, Officer Jack with the Houston Police Department? I had a conversation with someone from the Houston Police Department. I don't remember the exact name. And when you talked with that police officer with the Houston Police Department, did he actually call you to get a statement from you about what had occurred with the assault between you and Megan? I guess you could characterize it as a statement, yes. And did you give him a statement? I did. And do you recall telling him that the only thing that you did was put your hand over her mouth to keep her from screaming? I did say that, but I didn't say I put my hand on her mouth. You never said that you put her hand, your hand on her mouth? I didn't say I put it on her mouth. Okay, what did, what did you say? I said I put my hand over her mouth. In front of, I meant in front of like this. I never put my hand on physically on her face. Okay. So you disagree with the fact that you put her, when she says you put her hand, you put hands on her, you disagree with that? Absolutely. But you'd agree with me that after that night, just like you said, just like that, she was gone, right? Yes. And she didn't want anything to do with you after that, did she? I'm not particularly sure you could characterize it as that. Well. She ran to my mother's house to spend the night, and then she went to my family's house to stay with them. And that, that made you mad, didn't it? Not particularly. Didn't you express to your sister-in-law that you were pretty frustrated that she was housing your girlfriend? I don't recall when I, I did that. Were you mad that, um, did you ask your sister-in-law, you know, Leslie Jacob? Do you know who I Leslie do. Jacob is? I do. And did you ask Leslie Jacob to help assist you in trying to get Megan back? I did. And did you um, exchange a series of text messages um, with Leslie in an attempt to reconcile with Megan? I believe I did. And in one of those text messages, didn't you communicate to Leslie that if she wasn't going to fix this, that she needed to get 
Megan out of the house. I don't remember exactly what was written, but if you show me. Judge, may I approach the witness? You may. I'm going to show you what I've marked as case exhibit number 75. This is an exchange of text messages, and I want you to read right here. Just, yeah, read it to yourself. That one second right there. Yes, sir. We are not over. Not to your, oh. I said to yourself. Oh, sorry. Okay. Got it? Yeah. Here you go. Recall telling your sister-in-law um, that she needed to fix things between you and Megan? I don't recall exactly telling her that, but something similar, yes. And um, did you become upset? that they were keeping her at their home? Not particularly at you, first. Well, eventually did you become upset? I don't remember my exact mindset. Okay, well, do you recall saying if she won't even consider taking you? Is that an evidence? It is not, Judge. So you're testifying from evidence? No, Judge, I'm just at, so Well, I'm happy to <coughs> state off your state's exhibit 75, tendered to opposing counsel. I'm sorry, Mr. Horn. No objection, Your Honor. Thank you so much. State 75 is admitted. Continue, please. Thank you. Do you recall um, texting your sister-in-law, Leslie, if she won't consider taking me back, kick that bitch out and I will stay there. I'm family. <coughs> I don't recall exactly when I sent the text, but it sounds like something I would have sent. Okay. Um, and because you, you were upset that they were taking care of your girlfriend, correct? I don't think I was upset they were taking care of my girlfriend, but I had moved out of my, our, our apartment and I would have liked to have stayed at my brother and sister-in-law's house instead of a woman that hadn't, hadn't wanted nothing to do with me. And your brother actually didn't let you stay at his house, did he? No, Megan was staying there. At all? So after this fight, did you stay at Adam's house at I all? I didn't ask him to stay there after that. That wasn't my question. Did you stay at Adam's house after this happened? Yes or no? No. Did you stay at your mom's house for an extended period of time after this happened? Yes or no? Yeah. And during this time, like you said, you were desperate for Megan, right? You wanted to get back with her. I did. And you took a lot of things and you, you took a lot of steps in order to try and reconcile with her, didn't you? Absolutely. Um, now, during this time when you're so desperate for Megan, wouldn't you agree with me that you moved in with Valerie McDaniel just seven days after your fight with Megan? I don't think I moved in with her seven days after my fight with Megan. She let me stay there for a couple of nights on and off. Isn't it true that you all started having sex seven days after you and Megan broke up? I don't remember exactly how many days after it was. Well, do you recall communicating to Valerie Mc McDaniel at some point in your relationship? that you all had been sleeping together for 44 days straight. Do you remember sending her that text message? I don't remember sending her the exact number of days it was. Judge, at this time, State Offer States Exhibit number 76, an exchange of text messages and I'll tender to opposing counsel for any objections. No objection. I, I take it we skipped several uh, purposes. Yes, Judge. It's a bit. Thank you. Let me ask you, do you recall back on March the 2nd of 2017 texting Valerie McDaniel saying, did you know that you have been laid 44 straight days in a row now? I don't recall the exact date or what I wrote, but it sounds like something I would have communicated to Valerie. And if that's correct, you'd agree with me that that would have put you sleeping with Valerie McDaniel just seven days after you and Megan broke up, correct? If the math is correct, yes. Okay. So when you tell the members of this jury that you're heartsick over Megan, that's not really true, is it? Because it sure didn't take you long to move on, did it? Matters of the heart and how you feel are subject to the way you feel at a moment. I mean, you're asking me to to get up here and say that I'm some womanizer, that's fine. You can characterize me as that. It doesn't make me guilty of solicitation of capital murder. I have no problem sitting here and saying that I slept with Valerie seven days after Megan and I broke up.
but I'm not on trial for being a womanizer. I'm on trial for solicitation of capital murder. So you can assassinate my character all you want up here. It doesn't make me guilty of what you've charged me with. I appreciate that, Mr. Jacob, but my question was, um, isn't it true that just seven days after you and Megan broke up that you were sleeping with Valerie McDaniel? I think he answered. Absolutely. Okay. And so when Laura Thurlow was testifying, do you recall your lawyer asking her a lot of questions about your behavior at the time that you were having her help you with things? Yes. And you recall her characterizing your behavior as bizarre? Yes. Um, you mentioned that Valerie, when, when uh, your lawyer on direct examination asked you who Valerie McDaniel was, you mentioned that she was your girlfriend slash your common law wife, right? It could be characterized as common law married, yes. And it was important for you to be characterized as common law married when all of this went down, wasn't it? It's just a reality of what the situation was. Right. Would you agree with me that you had numerous conversations with your mother about the fact that it was really important that you and Valerie be considered common law married? You'd have to refresh my memory, but yes, I remember something like that. And do you remember call, telling your mother um, that she needs to make sure that your belongings stay over at Valerie's condo because when this trial comes up, you need to be able to say that you two are common law married. I don't believe it was a reference to the trial. I believe it was a reference to the fact that I was not on bond at the time and Valerie had bonded out before her death. And I wanted to be able to go live with my wife if I was given a bond. Didn't you say when she takes the fifth, I'll be able to say, she'll be able to say we're common law married? Wasn't that your concern? Not particularly. I may have said that, but I was more concerned that if I got out on bond, I'd be able to go back to my home. Because that's the only place she had to go, right? It's where I would have wanted to been. And when Mac McDaniel found out that you were actually staying over at Valerie's house, you knew he was upset about that, didn't you? Of course I knew he was upset about that. He blamed me for their divorce. And... When he found out that you were over there, you knew that he and Valerie came to an agreement that as long as Natalie was over there, you weren't supposed to be over there, were you? I was never made aware of an agreement between the two of them. So you didn't know that you weren't supposed to be there when Natalie was there? No, I did not. Valerie never told you that she was upset with Mac because he didn't want her daughter around you? Can you repeat the question again? Sure. Valerie never told you about the agreement that she had with Mac? Not that I knew of. Um, you mentioned that um, he, Mac was upset with you about the divorce. Is that right? That's my understanding, yes. I never spoke to him about it. And you know that if, if Valerie was in violation of some sort of agreement with Mac, that Natalie would have to go stay with Mac, correct? I'm not a family lawyer. I can't answer that question. Well, could you answer whether or not you were being allowed to stay there when Natalie was there? Did you know that? I assumed that I was allowed to stay there. I was living at the apartment. If Natalie was there and you weren't supposed to be there, you would have no place to go, right? You're asking me to give you a hypothetical answer to a hypothetical question. Well, didn't frustrate you that Mac didn't want you to stay at the apartment with Valerie? I could have cared less what Mac thought. Didn't it frustrate you that Mac was making a big deal about the situation and you were going to have no place to go? I could have cared less what Mac thought. And isn't it true that you started to egg Valerie on and feed her information about her ex-husband, didn't you? No. Do you recall in the recordings both at the Olive Garden and at Willowick, you calling Mac a piece of shit over and over and over? I do. Okay. Let's talk about the Olive Garden. First off, you mentioned early on direct examination that one of the things that you were concerned about out on the balcony was that you were scared when Javier showed you his gun. Is that right? That's true. You were fearful about that, right? Yes. And that's why you started talking about Guantanamo Bay with him. Yes. Okay, but isn't it true that over at the Olive Garden, you also talked about Guantanamo Bay? 
I don't remember exactly what So if on the recording, though, you're talking about Guantanamo Bay at the Olive Garden, you wouldn't have any reason to disagree with the recording, would you, Mr. Jacob? No. Okay. And um, you never saw Javier with a gun at the Olive Garden, did you? No. You weren't fearful of him at the Olive Garden, were you? Slightly. Well, you're in a public place, right? Yes. And, and it's your testimony that you were just meeting with a private investigator, right? He was described to me prior to our meeting as a Navy SEAL and somebody who was not to be messed with. And you went there to meet with him, didn't you? Yes. And before you met with him, you had a phone conversation with Zach, correct? I had several phone conversations with Mac prior to meeting with him. And in one of those phone conversations that we heard in court, you told Zach, is he going to take care of both problems, correct? I believe so. Both problems. I just answered your question. I believe so. Okay. And so you go to the Olive Garden and you meet with Javier and then you also have Zach and Valerie there, correct? The four of us were there, yes. Okay. And when you step outside and you begin speaking with Officer Duran, you'd agree with me that we hear you on the video ask him, are you a cop? I did. You were concerned whether or not he was a police officer, weren't you? Probably. Well, concerned enough to ask him a question, right? Yes. And while you're at Olive Garden, you mentioned that um, Valerie has a conversation with Javier, and you know, you know nothing about what was said, right? No, I do not. I did not at the time. I know now. Well, you knew then, too, didn't you? No. Well, because do you recall coming back to the table at the Olive Garden and Javier telling you, she wants her ex-husband dead? I don't really recall that. He may have said it, but I don't remember. Do you recall Javier saying to you, so she's decided that she wants her ex to be gone? I, I think he did say something to that effect, but he didn't use the word dead or killed. That was my question. Do you recall Javier saying, so she's decided that she wants her ex to be gone? I think if that's what you said, it said on the tape, and that's what it said. Okay. And then your response was, I got it. If you say so. And then when just a few sentences later, your statement to Javier is, I can give you $2,500 a week for four weeks. That's probably the best and the easiest. Do you remember saying that, Mr. Jacob? Something to that effect, yes. So to tell the members of this jury that you didn't know what agreement Valerie and Javier had come up with, that's not exactly true, is it? I knew about the agreement for the money, of course. And what it was for, too. I just told you I didn't know what it was for. Well, do you recall the undercover officer trying to clarify what kind of car Matt drove? I do. And you clarified for him? I don't think I clarified for him. I think she did. Mm -hmm. Recall Valerie saying a Land Cruiser and Javier saying a Land Cruiser, and then you say, is that what type he's got? Well, I think that your question would then actually depict a situation where I didn't know what kind of car he drove. Were you clarifying what kind of car that Mac McDaniel drove? To myself, yes. Okay. And you recall right after that, Javier saying a brand new Land Cruiser, carjack him, put a bullet in his head, throw him on the street, and make sure he's gone. Make sure he's dead for sure, and then park his truck in one of those apartment complexes. You know, one of those shitty apartment complexes. When can I get the first payment? Do you recall Javier saying that to you? Yeah, the Olive Garden? Yes, sir. If you said that's what he said on the tape, and that's what he said. That's what he said. And in direct response to that, you say... I can give you $2,500 a week for four weeks. That's probably the best and easiest. And correct? that's the chronological order it happened in? Right. If you say it's the chronological order it happened in, then I have to say yes. Okay. So you're agreeing to give him $2,500 just after he tells you, I'm going to put a bullet in his head and throw him on the street. If that's what you say. Well, that's in the recording. It's not what I say. It's what Javier and you said, right? 
I guess. You kept saying on direct examination that you never used uh, the words hurt or ask for anybody to be killed, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and you didn't want anyone to be kidnapped either, did you? No. You said that on direct examination. You said, I don't want anybody to be hurt. I don't. I never ask for anybody to be hurt or kidnapped, correct? True. But that's not true, right? Because you told Javier, snatch her, put her in a room, and tell her if she doesn't fucking leave, I'm going to kill her parents, right? If that's what you say, I said. Did you say it, Mr. Jacob? Sure. Did you say it? Yes, I guess if that's what the tapes say. And when you say snatch her, that's kidnapping, right? If that's what you want to define it as. Well, how else would you define snatch? I don't know. I left it up to him how to do that stuff. That's certainly not her willing to go with you, right? We were just talking about stuff at the time. I left the discretion up to him how he wanted to handle the situation. I think that if you ask me what my mindset was, I was just having a conversation about possible scenarios. I wasn't giving him any directions. So when you're telling him snatch her and put her in a hotel room, you're not giving him any directions? I, I think I put it as, so what are you going to do? It was a question, actually, that I asked him. No, actually, the statement you made was snatch her, put her in a room, and if she doesn't fucking leave, tell her you're going to kill her parents. I think I posed it as a question to him. Does that sound like directions to you? If it's posed in a question, I don't think it's directions. What, what, what kind of question is that? I don't know. So you want to know if this private investigator could snatch her? I think we were just having a conversation. Um, did you not want anybody hurt when you said, inject her with potassium chloride, stop her heart, untraceable? I said that was a, something you could do. I didn't say that for him to do that. You'd agree with me that if you injected someone with potassium chloride and stopped their heart, that it would hurt them? Yes. It would kill them? Yes. You knew that as a doctor? Yes. Um, what, did you recall telling the undercover officer, if those options don't work, I don't give a fuck, then you got to do what you got to do because my survival is more important? Yes. You said that, right? I did. And you meant that, didn't you? At the time, I don't know what I meant. Well, what you meant was that you were upset that Megan had, had filed assault family member charges against you, weren't you? Anybody would be upset about having a false police report filed against them. So is that a yes, Mr. Jacob? Were you upset? Of course I was. And were you a little bit frustrated that if that assault family member case stuck against you that you weren't going to be able to try and reinvent your medical career, correct? Yes. It was certainly a hindrance to that, wasn't it? Yep. And if you're convicted of assault family member and stalking a felony, you're not going to be able to practice medicine anymore, are you? Most likely not. And medicine's pretty important to you, isn't it? It is. And so the fact that you might not be able to try and reinvent your medical career was upsetting to you, wasn't it? Yes, it was. And, and that assault family member case was what stood between, in your mind, what stood between you and your medical license. It was a hindrance. It was a hindrance, right? And if that assault family member case went away, then you were all good, right? I don't know if I was all good, but it would certainly be better than having it. It certainly wouldn't be in the way of you being a doctor, right? If it wasn't, didn't exist, it's not going to be in the way of anything. Okay. And Initially, you were upset when she obtained that protective order, too, weren't you? Which protective order are you talking about, the temporary one or the one we agreed to, the no contact order? The temporary one. Well, that came with the charges for assault and violence. And you were upset about that, weren't you? 
Well, of course I was upset about the, the uh, assault and violence charges to begin with. Um, you were concerned that it might be public record that um, you had been asked to stay away from her, weren't you? Now you're talking about something different. Well, let's talk about the two-year protective order. Were you concerned that it was made public? It was agreed upon that it would be sealed. And it wasn't, right? No, it was not. And you're frustrated about that, weren't you? Well, typically when you're told by the law that they're going to do something and they don't, it's frustrating. And you were frustrated, weren't you? Of course I was. Okay. And again, with a, with a two-year protective order in place, that affects your ability to get employment, doesn't it? I don't necessarily think it does or does not. I was already employed. You would agree with me that most employers probably are going to be a little bit cautious about hiring someone who has a two-year protective order in place on them, right? That's not for me to speculate. I already had a job. It didn't really concern me about my present employment. which is why I signed it voluntarily. Yeah, there, there was no, it, it wasn't a contested hearing, was it? No. No. In fact, um, you all scratched out that language and all came to an agreement that you'd stay away from Megan. It was you? a two-year joint no-contact order, yes. Okay. And when you told Megan that you were frustrated that she got a protective order, which, which protective order were you talking about? Were you talking about the temporary one or the two-year one? I don't remember. But you sent her an email after one of them went in place telling her, did you really get a protective order, didn't you? You have to give me some dates and I could probably clarify that for you. Judge, may I approach? You may. Mr. Jacob, I'm going to show you what's been entered into evidence in States Exhibit 49, if you'll take a look at that for me. This would be Thursday, February. The 29th of February. Um, I can't recall which one I was referring to. Okay, but you were mad about it. Well, I was asking a question, do you seriously get a protection order against me? And my question is, were you mad about it? I was, you know, a little upset. I was upset about it. You're upset that a lower middle class girl from Pittsburgh had brought charges against you, weren't you? It had nothing to do with where she was from. Well, you mentioned it several times to the undercover officer, didn't you? You're asking me two different questions. No, I'm not. I'm asking you, did you mention to the undercover officer that Megan was a lower middle class girl from Pittsburgh? That wasn't your question you asked me before. You asked me if I was upset that she ordered it, 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 that characterization and she, she, she filed a protective order against me. So it's two questions. The first question was, was I upset that she had a protective order against me? The answer is yes. Her upbringing had nothing to do with that whatsoever. Her upbringing was an issue to you, wasn't it? No, it wasn't, actually. You felt like, how dare this lower, middle-class citizen bring charges against Dr. McDaniel, or Dr. Jacob? Not necessarily. I was more upset with her the fact that she lied to me about her education. She comes from a very, very nice family. That's not what you told the undercover officer, is it? I think I did at some point. I said that I like her family a lot. You also told uh, undercover officer, these are just lower class middle girls from Pittsburgh. You said that, right? About characterizing Megan and one of her friends. Right. Uh, let's talk about the last few phone conversations that you had with Officer Green. May I approach Judge? Do you need, do you need this back? I'll just give it back to her. been entered into evidence of state's exhibit number 22. Do you remember Officer Duran sending you this photograph? 
I remember him sending me something like that or similar. So at the time, it was your belief that Megan Veracost was somewhere zip-tied, correct? Uh, yes. And it was your belief that your Megan Veracost was somewhere with duct tape wrapped around her mouth, right? Yes. And in seeing this picture, you'd agree with me that no time did you tell Officer Duran, whoop, time out, stop, this has gone too far, I don't want any part of this. You never said that, did you? Not those exact words, I did not. You didn't tell him stop? I tried to delay him. Mr. Jacob, my question is, did you tell Officer Duran, stop? No. Did you tell Officer Duran, I don't like where this is going? Not those exact words. You didn't use those words, did you? No. No. Um, in fact, you are under the belief, while you're talking to Officer Duran, that Megan is somewhere in this city, tied up, bound, duct taped, and you're having conversations with Officer Duran during that, right? Yes. And at this point, you also believe that Mac McDaniel is dead. <coughs> yes. You believe that Officer Duran has taken care of Mac McDaniel, don't you? That's what he told us, yes. He told you that at the Willowick apartment, right? Yes. And he told you that as you guys went out on the balcony, didn't he? Either the balcony, yes, yeah, somewhere in the apartment he told us about it. And Val after Officer Duran tells you that he's taking care of Mac McDaniel, Valerie actually excuses herself and goes back inside the condo, doesn't she? Yes. And that's when you stay out on the patio with Officer Duran, correct? Yep. And this man that you're so afraid of, you offered him a beer when he came in, didn't you? Um, yeah, I think that, I don't remember which conversation it was, but yes, at some point we did have alcoholic drinks on the balcony. And this man that you're so afraid of, you actually offered to let him have sushi with you guys too, right? I, I think so, yes. And this man that you're so afraid of, you actually told him that you felt like you had become friends with him and you wanted to stay in contact with him so he should touch base with you in the future, right? I don't think it was out of so much comfort as I was, do you want me to continue or? Go ahead. I'm not really sure I wanted to be friends with him. I, I really didn't know how to react uh, around him. Officer Duran inject Megan with a syringe? I think I did. Did you offer to help Officer Duran inject Megan with potassium chloride? I think I did. Did you? I, yes. And you know as a doctor that potassium chloride will kill someone? Yes. And so by helping him inject Megan with potassium chloride, it would result in her death? That would be the logical conclusion. It would be the conclusion. Yes. There's an explanation why I offered One that. One second, Mr. Jacob. The night that you were arrested, you recall officers coming to the condo where you're staying with Valerie? Which arrest are you referring to? When Sergeant Quinn came to the condominium to do the arrest, do you recall when he came there that night? Yes. And do you recall walking into the living area of the condominium complex and being told that Mac had been killed in an apparent robbery? Yes. And when you learn that information, do you turn to Sergeant Quinn or any of the other officers there and go, you know what, I have information for you, you need to hear this. Do you say that to them? No. Do you feign surprise um, at the idea that Mac McDaniel is dead? I think I did. You did, right? Because that was part of the act that you all were putting on for the police that night, right? I wasn't really sure how to react. Well, you certainly had to be careful how you reacted because at that point you believed that you had paid an undercover officer money to kill Mac, right? No. And it was important for you not to let the officers know that you'd been involved in his death, right? No. You didn't tell the officers that you had paid Officer Duran $2,500 to take care of a problem, did you? I absolutely did not pay Officer Duran $2,500. You didn't tell officers that you paid Officer Duran $1,800, did you? 
No. You didn't volunteer that information to the officers that night, did you? No, I did not. Instead, when they ask you um, if you knew of any problems that Mac had, you said, I didn't even really know the guy. I think I met him once, right? I did. That's the truth. Okay. And they didn't ask me if I knew of any problems he had. They asked me if I knew the man. And what was your response? That I barely met him once or I met him once. Right. And you also let the officers know, look, we've been here all night. I did. And we've been watching movies here all day. I did. And so you'd agree with me that that's giving the officers an explanation as to your whereabouts and what you all had been doing that day, correct? They asked us if we had any information. I said we've been at the apartment all day. You volunteered that to them, right? In a response to their question. And you also let them know that you've been there all day. I think we've established that, yes. Okay. And at no time during that did you say, officers, uh, i got to tell you something. This guy has my girlfriend tied up across town. Did you tell him that? We were arrested after the undercover officer had already told me he had shot Megan in the head twice. So why was I going to tell them something that I knew that was no longer relevant? At least that's what I was portrayed to me. So you felt like at that point Megan was dead? I was told she was. And you believed she was? Absolutely. You don't think that was something you maybe should have shared with those officers that night? I'm not really sure what I should have done. I was in shock all around about what was happening. Judge, may I have a moment? Yes, you may. Briefly, please. Uh, Mr. Jacob, you needed an email to be sent from Megan to you, didn't you? I didn't need to have an email sent. You certainly wanted it, right? Yes. If you felt like it would make your criminal case go away, didn't you? Yes. And you asked, you let Officer Duran know that it was important to you that you get this email sent from Megan's phone to your phone, correct? Yes. And you let Officer Duran know what you needed that email to say so that you could give it to your lawyer, correct? Yes. And you had an elaborate plan that once that email was sent, you weren't going to open it, right? That would have violated a, const, uh, a, a uh, violation of the no contact order for myself. And you would then turn that over to your lawyer, correct? Yes. And then your belief was that your lawyer could then go to court and show that to the judge in charge of your assault family member case, correct? Sure. And so you were willing to go to all those links in order to get your assault family member case dismissed, weren't you? Sure. And you were willing to allow something to happen to Megan so that she wouldn't be present for your assault family member case, right? That's incorrect. Well, you said numerous times in the recordings, we heard it over and over, it's really important that she not be there for my hearing, correct? Yes. You told Officer Duran, I'm, as soon as she's gone, I'm going to expedite the fuck out of this. You told him that, right? Yes. And that's because if Megan's out of the picture, your assault family member case goes away. Yes, but still alive. You were okay with Megan being taken out of state for your survival, right? I never asked him to take her out of state. You didn't ask her to be taken out of state? I was told that's where she wanted to go. Well, you, did you ask Officer Duran if, if he could take her out of, of state? And Officer Duran's response to you was, I don't know, there's there's some issues with that. That that makes that could be kind of problematic. Do you remember that in the recording? I don't recall exactly what I said, but it could be something like that. Isn't at the end of the day, what this is all about is your survival? I mean, do you recall telling Officer Duran, my survival is more important than anything? I think I might have said that. You said that, right? Mm-hmm. Yes? I, I guess I did, yeah. Judge, I pass the witness.
apartment, please. Yes, Judge. Uh, may we approach quickly? Yes. Then remember your admonishments not to discuss the case, and we'll see you back at 9.30 in the morning. Stand adjourned. All rise for the jury.